Hi, Nikolai. Hello, Peter. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast on uh, Everyday Mentality. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. No, it's my pleasure. And I've yeah. been waiting several years for you to invite me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I pretty much it. Uh, Nikolai, I, I contacted you because I read in uh, the, the Danish paper in Chinua that uh, uh, you are our Danish chairman of the European initiative named Advanced Material for Industrial Leadership. And uh, as I am very curious, I would like to learn a little more about uh, how we should become uh, leaders in Europe uh, when when we talk about advanced materials. Um, and I hope you are ready to to tell a little more about that. I'm ready, but I, I am going to correct you a little bit since I'm I'm chairman of nothing. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> but, uh, but I have been engaged in in some European sort of grassroots initiative. A good thing about grassroots initiatives is then then there's sort of a no formal leadership. So I've contributed to some of these things that have now become how should I put it, European strategies. So so uh, I think uh, I can probably answer the same questions that you would have to ask me anyway, but I, I cannot yes. claim any official title there. Uh, you are my uh, personal chairman today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll take that role. <laughs> but uh, then, Nikolai, uh, if, if you're not the chairman, can you tell a little more about uh, who you are, uh, your name, your background, and and uh, your dedication for materials, uh, how was that initiated? Uh, did, did you get a just a light bulb or, or what, yeah, what initiated? Yeah, let's see, uh, how, how far back should I actually go here? I, 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 you know, I, I think I probably have to go all the way back to university. I'm, I'm 50 years old, so that's quite a while ago. It's a good um, age. I, I actually started studying mathematics and, and I couldn't, choose that on its own accord so i had to choose physics on top mm -hmm. uh, but i think the mathematics was sort of a drive for perfection that everything was based on axioms so what i then chose to specialize in was in material science uh, within physics also focusing on sort of perfect crystals and point defects and these things it was a beautiful world <laughs> quite narrow and then at some point reality hits and you see, OK, actually, when things are working out uh, in society, mm. um, you know, the, the material understanding at a defect level is very good, but you also need to make some assumptions and, and some macroscopic considerations. Um, so I sort of uh, shifted a little bit from the, the very basic research into really applied uh, research and also seeing how it actually works and when it makes a difference. So I think, um, yeah, my, my PhD and, and also postdoc was in, in semiconductors. Um, mm -hmm. Then when I came back to Denmark, I, um, uh, I, I got involved with accelerator science, but still sort of with, an, with a materials perspective. And actually, that's, that's when we uh, also started uh, hanging out, I think, yeah. because I, I was at Danfysik and, and Siemens where we, we made magnets. Uh, yes. And we share that uh, passion, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm very fascinated by by magnets. Yeah. Um, my my main direction in magnets was in, in uh, superconductors and, and the high temperature mm -hmm. superconductors. Um, and I guess if I have to point to one place where I still maintain some uh, sort of uh, professionalism, it, it's within the field of, of high temperature superconductors. Uh, for the rest of the, the things, I, I am a generalist. So I now work with uh, with materials quite broadly. Mm -hmm. A lot of engagement into, into especially the metallic materials and steels, mm -hmm. uh, but also looking at, at coatings and materials for quantum technologies. So that that's my one passion. And then my, my second passion that sort of grew out of this accelerator engagement is the the what I would call big science facility. So mm. I, I'm now director of our big science center here at, at uh, the Danish Technological Institute, uh, where basically we're, we're tapping into these massive investments into science that are going on throughout Europe and seeing how does that fit with a company? How can a company use it or become engaged with these facilities? And to me, that that's it's just such a 
fascinating uh, place to be be involved because it's it's a lot of big investments going out uh, to support the science but there's always an industrial angle and an angle for society and really finding those and bringing them to to uh, to industry in particular danish companies is a is a big passion for me hmm. yeah thank you uh that was a good introduction uh, i can uh, mention actually another thing so i hmm? even though i'm a director i mean I, we also uh, regularly engage in in r d projects and and a few years ago i i, I fell in love with my own Project. So I, we send in a application to to EU and and they funded it and and I realized that I I needed to coordinate this project. So I, I'm also <laughs> coordinator of a European project hmm. um, on residual stresses in in metals um, and actually also I guess formally a, a convener for a standardization group within this area as well so it's it's all within the sort of generalist field but uh, I do have my yeah. fingers many places yeah. and and measuring residual stresses with uh, uh, particle accelerators a uh, neutron beam or yeah, exactly. Neutrons and and synchrotrons as well. Uh, so the yeah. the standard we're making, which mm -hmm. is actually at, at these uh, these weeks are out for a vote with the SEN, the European Standardization Organization. Um, so that standard is with within uh, residual stress measurement using synchrotrons. Okay, <laughs> and it it's a bit deeper. Uh, it's very deep, but I mean, to us, the the ambition here is that that. These techniques have been matured in the academic world for for decades, actually. So bringing them out to industry and saying, OK, it, it's actually not hocus pocus, this stuff. I mean, you can just go there and have these measurements done. Uh, uh, that's also an, uh, an element of this bringing the big science into to companies. Hmm. Yeah. Um, now. Nicola, if we, if we are going to turn into this uh, European initiative, grassroots initiative, <laughs> what uh, what does it cover? Uh, what is the, the the meaning of it, and and who is involved? Uh, uh, you said it was from the very top uh, when we spoke with uh, Ursula von Leyen, uh, taking charge uh, of of the initiative. Basically, I mean, the, the, the catchphrase that, that you mentioned there, so I'll repeat it, the advanced materials for industrial leadership. That one appeared uh, when Ursula von der Leyen did her, what's it called, State of the Union, I think, in September last year. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, materials was there as a as a key priority for Europe. And and uh, we could barely get, uh, get our hands down there because, uh, uh, as you say, it started as a grassroots initiative. And, and actually through this European project where I was involved, we also supported this activity and, and gave some input. And I think in late 2022, it, it sort of culminated with a, a big report. You can find it online under the Advanced Materials Initiative 2030, mm -hmm. uh, where a lot of uh, material scientists, uh, industry people, basically co-authored um, a big report. Uh, I think we were, I think there were some 450 names there in the end. Wow. Um, basically saying, okay, we need to do something with the materials area. Uh, and that then someone, that's not me, have been lobbying that to EU and then finally it, it was adopted uh, last year and then with some concrete actions that came out here in, in February as well. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so if we start, uh, you, you, you need a problem uh, before you do something. So what is the problem? So uh, I, I'm going to stay on the abstract level here. I'm sorry. But uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the challenge that we saw, I mean, materials has always been recognized as a as a key enabler in in a lot of different technologies but there, there was a trend some 10 years ago that that every time it was mentioned the material science materials development it had to fit into some other bracket um so i mean for example the uh, excellent materials researchers at, at dtu they continued to do their excellent materials research but now they it was called dtu wind 
so it was given a, a framework there yeah, okay. and the same for for the sort of the innovation clusters that was established uh, in Denmark then it was never materials on its own it was also material to support something else yeah and as I said, in the green transition materials in carbon energy capture. materials yes yeah, like, um, yeah. And I mean, the activities were still there and excellent people working on it, but mm. it was just always given some label. And I think what what became apparent was that um, it was really devaluating the, the research into materials uh, going on. Mm. Uh, and and there, was, uh, there was a need to establish materials as an element on its own, especially when we are looking towards investments being made in the US and uh, and, and in uh, Asia and, and other countries. I mean, they were putting a lot of money into this and, and really developing a lot of nice things. And, and the sort of at the lead we've had in, in Europe for many years, we will see no, we're, we're no longer in the lead uh, in this mm. area. And that's becoming a problem because then yeah. The newest uh, materials and coatings and magnets and everything will be developed elsewhere and applied there, and then we can sort of be followers in Europe. Mm -hmm. That's that's not really a sustainable uh, uh, way to go. Mm -hmm. So as mentioned, this started sort of murmuring at this grassroots level, and and now have been lifted out to this uh, new strategic agenda. So is it now you will mention magnets that has been quite dominated by China for many many years? Is it an initiative to enable the European uh, society and companies to produce magnets, or is it to develop next generation material and, and not just uh, copy what exists already? I mean, there's a specifically on on magnets. Uh, since I mean, you've also been heavily involved there, and 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 there's the the whole resilience agenda going on saying, okay, where's the world moving and who who can we rely on being collaborators with us for, for the years coming forward? And at least there's a there's a recognition in uh, at every level, both in Denmark and EU, that 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 we need more autonomy. We need to be able to um, master our own resources in materials. So maybe do we need to reopen mines in Europe? I'm I'm not sure yet, but but uh, for sure we need to to have some better channels for especially those called the critical raw materials. Mm. Um, so that that certainly be and a lot of the initiative was also come from this uh, sort of resilience thinking that that okay we are part of global supply chain but we also need to be able to make these things ourselves if mm. something should happen because it can never become a sort of political pressure instrument uh, mm. to to be the master of some particular materials mm. whether that means that we need to develop new magnets yes we we would love that but uh, uh, new batteries and different things it, it's it's always a race and and we can also uh, help each other by by putting each other st staying mm. on our toes and and uh, advancing these things mm. um, and there's a couple of things so, so i mean there's a quite nice um, communication from from the European Commission that actually highlights uh, a lot of these challenges that we're facing. Um, mm. And for example, I mean the the speed of development in Europe uh, appears to be uh, running at a at a slower pace than other places in the world. Um, mm -hmm. I think the the famous examples you would look at a, at a Tesla or a rocket launcher and and see they it, it's that thinking mm. of making it trying it out if it fails then you know a little bit more maybe mm. we have been a little bit uh, over regulated in in europe and, and a bit hesitant in in actually doing the things yeah um I, I could agree to a certain level on that uh, if if we look at uh, the the latest uh, funding that has been made in reducing carbon emission uh, in EU there's a lot of initiatives uh, where where you can get funding but funding uh, always has to come in big projects with consortiums. Uh, the consortium leaders are typically universities and you have to apply for it writing uh, 
quite a big application, 50, 100 pages. Uh, so I, I would say typically five to eight man month just writing an application. Um, and uh, then you have to wait half a year or a year to learn if you can start the project. Where uh, in the US, uh, they have also taken initiatives to reduce carbon emission. Uh, I don't remember how many billion dollars they have uh, set aside, but the way you can get uh, this money is tax refunding, uh, all kinds of incentives for companies and individuals. But the universities are not really mentioned in, in this. It has to be driven by uh, incentives. Mm. Yep. Uh, so therefore, speed is a lot higher. Yes, I, I, I agree. And, and the bureaucracy in Europe is a challenge. Um, that That's for sure. That's one thing. The second thing that, that you actually point to is, is the role of private investments. Um, where, I mean, in, in Denmark especially, we have these large foundations that also hand out money. So, I mean, there, there is money in the companies, but the question is, how do they spend them uh, most wisely? Mm. And and for sure, the structure in Europe that, that couples the private and the public funding are not very well established. So, actually, they do have a special activity on seeing how can they use the, the private funding, how can that leverage the activities. And for sure, if you're a company and, and have millions to invest, then you want to decide what should be uh, invested and you don't want to wait for some big European system to mm -hmm. uh, make an assessment because basically you know what you want to do. Yeah. <laughs> but having systems that can accommodate both those, I, I think that's it's one of the most challenging of the tasks they actually laid out mm -hmm. because there it's not just it's not just pouring out money into some ministers. It's actually having to think about what would make the most efficient structure for for increased materials mm -hmm. R and D. Yeah, Nikolai, I'll, I'll try. Even though you said you'd like to stay on the abstract level, I'll try to to push you a little. Oh, uh, <laughs> sorry. Lights went out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, it's a dangerous well, Very sim symbolic, yes. Yeah. Uh, um, in, in Europe, there has been recently published uh, the new scarcity list uh, of materials that are on, on, on risk level. It, it has been there for a long time, but I saw that recently copper and nickel also uh, entered uh, the list. Uh, can you put some words on that? Does this uh, how to handle this scarcity list? Is that also a part of the uh, initiative? Um, it it certainly is. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start answering question by answering something else. So yeah. <laughs> let's see how uh, if we can circle back. <laughs> um, no, I mean one of the recognitions that that is that it's expressed in in the communications uh, from from the commission is that material is is a key in many of the different strategies that are already out there. And now you mentioned the the critical raw material strategy. There's also the circular economy um, action plan. It's called. There's uh, mm -hmm. clean energy technologies, uh, an action plan on that, and the European mm -hmm. Green Deal, the Chips Act, um, the whole quantum area. So all these strategies, they have materials as an element and and the new thing is that now it's being brought out forward as its, its own strategy that still means that that what we do here should still be supporting some of these things for example the the, um, the critical raw materials uh, uh, act and, and the list there so you mentioned copper and and uh, and nickel hmm. um i want to answer it a little bit generally by also saying that that materials are going to get more expensive, there's no way around that, um, mm. and that that also goes uh, against the trend of getting it the the cheapest place and finding ways to to uh, uh, source it uh, in the most efficient way. That that it's going to get more expensive, and there's there's a couple of reasons for that. Of course, there's rising price of energy. <clears throat> But there's also these circular economy activities, and, and obviously copper would fall into one of those, mm -hmm. saying that, that there has to be a price 
um, associated with digging copper out from a mine, because instead you could also get some of it at least from from old wirings if you were better at collecting it and and recycling it. So getting those cyclic uh, materials uh, chains running, it it requires some more work needs to be done in extracting it from the components. So so I certainly see that uh, to get those chains running, things will get uh, more expensive. Um, and then there's a sort of a, a materials managing layer on top of that with the, the digital passport for materials. Um, personally, I'm a, I'm a little, I, I think we, we need something. There needs to be a price in materials. But at the same time, I'm a little bit afraid uh, about the whole bureaucracy level uh, involved in the materials. So, so how do we set up systems where we're not just feeding a lot of money into administrative functions, uh, mm. but actually still getting the materials and and punishing those people who are producing materials in a in a polluting way um, rewarding those who who extract the materials in a clever way and put it back into circulation so to me there's a there's a dilemma there that that needs to be looked at over the coming years for sure hmm. so I, I spoke a lot and and probably didn't answer the question at all but i hope <laughs> <laughs> hope yeah. it helps <laughs> yeah um but how do now this is uh, nice words and we have to focus on it and we have to be aware of it but uh, if, if we go down to reality how does this uh, play out uh, will there be anybody working or will there just be somebody talking uh, um for sure there will be funding for this activity and and that's um uh, i mean if you divide it into two two um two parts and part of it is the sort of regulatory and setting up things that that yes by nature that will be people working at computers getting these things done uh, the second part which i'm much more interested in is is when you you get clever people to come up with ideas and and offer them the opportunity by by funding to to realize that and, and making it work and for sure there's going to be a lot of funding going into the material science where um, yes it it of course you should know the, the direction is this to make a new pump or is it to make a, a new coding or a quantum computer or whatever uh, but there will be more freedom in in actually developing and exploring and producing new materials uh, go, going forward so th that's mm. something that I'm, I'm very much looking forward to yeah. And and do you think this uh, this activity will that be driven by uh, universities or, or companies or, or who who will be the drivers uh, in in this? Well, that that's that's up to you, uh, Peter. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean a company will will need to look at what do they need and and do they want to be drivers or followers um and then if they want to be drivers they they should engage um i i think a lot of danish companies especially have been a bit withholding in 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 engaging in these uh, european sort of strategy groups um uh, might be an exception but but there mm -hmm. could be many more that that really stri tries to leverage the european strength here uh, i think europe as a whole it, it's the same kind of challenge but but we do see a lot of other big european companies that that really do engage and try and drive this in the right direction my experience is that that when the company joins they they are being listened to hmm. um of course as a company you need to to sort of formulate what is it that you you want to push for hmm. but if you if you come to the table with an agenda in that direction then you you will be listened to and you can impact what goes on um i don't see any way around these uh, sort of bit cumbersome rising european projects and therefore sure you need uh, universities and rtos to to take the lead hmm. uh, because it is a lot it is work intensive and it will be uh, evaluated and need to be uh, um, technical, high level, and and 
all these things and it's just more realistic but but i have to say that i i do find most universities uh, they will also listen to to what you need in industry and and they will from the best of their ability try and, and tailor it so that it fits uh, mm. with with industrial needs yeah. but you but you need to push them you cannot leave it to them uh, that's mm. for sure is there a call uh, that can be found somewhere um it's it's yet to be they yet to be published <clears throat> so the way the system works is that you have different uh, interest groups in each country and you can provide feedback to the programs that come out as mentioned we're going to see more programs sort of more on hardcore materials now so it's a good time to actually uh, go in and try and influence them mm -hmm. um so we we have a danish group for example looking into to the calls related to materials we provide input the ministry decides what to take and then they bring it to the table at a european level and the, luckily i'm not involved in that then then they discuss and prioritize mm -hmm. and in the end yes there's calls coming out <laughs> bad news is that when the calls come out then you probably know that someone is also already looking at this and and maybe uh, uh, engaged in consortia so should you <clears throat> how do you find them can you join a consortium yeah. there's a lot of good sort of matchmaking events where where you can you can go and you can find the partners you can find what's mm -hmm. going on where actually that fits my strategic interest uh, so there's a there's a big system for that and luckily that's going to improve quite a bit because one of the new activity initiatives is that mm -hmm. that they want to do a sort of digital map over what material r d activities are going on where so it should become much easier to navigate in finding uh, which academic groups around Europe is working mm -hmm. on this topic that I'm very interested in. Okay. <clears throat> I, I want to add another advice um, after I just sip a piece of, little mm -hmm. bit of water. Yeah. If you're active within a particular area, then, you know, find a, a local uh, you know, either DTI or uh, Danish University, find a group that's working this field because they will most often be very tuned on what's going on in this area around Europe. Mm -hmm. So, so use also your your sort of uh, local experts. Mm -hmm. That goes both for the Danish student at academics, but also any place else in Europe, probably the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Nikolai, if. Uh... If this really matters, uh, then how will we be able to see that in our daily life in uh, five, ten years from now? Uh, how will a European uh, feel that this has changed uh, our comfort or our daily life? I mean, there's a the ones that control the materials in my mind will be the one that controls the technology so <clears throat> having our own uh, electronics and uh, pumps and everything that means more wealth in in europe for sure uh, at a sort of more personal level then i mean the the work you're doing with with the uh, with magnets uh, and and the pumps uh, for for circulating water in residential buildings and mm. industry buildings so so having clean water accessible available i probably people don't appreciate that enough that actually there's a lot of technology that that makes that happen mm -hmm. um smartphones of course is another example that that mm. you know we're not thinking about it now, but just imagine the the amount of electronics and uh, uh, magnets and all this kind of stuff that is sitting in this small unit that that we really rely on. Uh, looking forward, ten years, <clears throat> mm. computer chips are gonna keep developing, and and the whole AR, VR, all these tools will will become more and more available, and and. Mm. By investing in this, uh, Europe is also hoping to stay sort of at least uh, on the curve. I don't want to say mm. ahead, of, ahead of the curve anymore because mm. I don't think that's where we are. Uh, mm. But we will be the ones that, that can adopt these things uh, uh, to begin with. Yeah. Um, 
that, that how many money are are in reality involved uh, because uh, uh, I know if you want to open a new mine uh, in in some areas they have found copper uh, opening a copper mine might cost uh, a billion euro yeah um, are the money available or is it just a dream that will never be realized? I don't think the European Commission would spend 1 billion euros on opening a mine. Mm -hmm. I think it's realistic. I think the budgets are, they, I mean, they're large. To me. Like, let's say uh, 500 million euros will go probably into materials R&D programs. That's mm -hmm. not enough to open a mine, but but it, mm -hmm. it also, it shouldn't be because a, a mine should also operate uh, as a, commercial uh, mm. investment yeah. as well. Mm. It can be subsidized to some extent. Uh, the whole sort of state aid uh, rules is is um, is being debated at the moment because it, it along with the realization that that we need to be autonomous and, and resilient in Europe, mm. do we have to give up some of these sort of holy principles uh, looking at how it's being done in the US and and uh, and China, for example? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think if you look to the European strategy, there'll be any mention of that because it is a it is a hot potato. Yeah. But but for Do sure, we have there's to a... expropriate uh, people from the homes uh, because we want to build uh, a mine here. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. That that <laughs> that could also be, be the case. But I mean, yeah. what my point is that that there'll be a lot of investment, also significant investment, but it will mainly be in in developing. Uh, mm. The processes that can then be implemented in a in a new mine to make it more clean, for example. But the investment itself is going to be uh, largely driven by by private funding as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, what do you think? Uh, they're doing some great advances up in the northern part of Sweden with the mine work there. Are yeah. you following that? Yeah, a bit. Um, I'm I'm following the. Uh, the new steel plant they are building uh, based on uh, direct reduction iron uh, with uh, they, they build a new power plant to, to produce uh, electrolysis hydrogen and, uh, and and make carbon free steel. Yeah. Um, I, I really like the initiative, but uh, if that is the way we are going to produce steel in the future, then uh, yeah, the raw materials are placed in the wrong places on the earth because uh, the the availability of power uh, from from water and wind is in the north mainly. So we have might have Finland, Sweden, Norway, Iceland, Canada, mm -hmm. and then I do not know where else to place uh, such a uh, steel plant. Uh, but a lot of the raw materials are found in Australia, in US, uh, uh, in in Africa. Uh, really, one of the one of the cheapest form to to transport the raw materials in is in some intermediate billets or something like that. So maybe we should bring those billets to the new energy fields that we are creating in the North Sea and have uh, have steel plants there. Yeah. But that's um, a, there's some dynamics going on there uh, for mm, sure. Yeah. Actually, I should yeah. mention that when we're talking advanced materials, then it, it's not only sort of um, the superconductors and stuff like that. I mean, mm. steel, when sort of um, nano or micro engineered, it, it's also an advanced material. And mm. yeah. I mean, so the stuff we're doing, understanding residual stresses and seeing how they can influence, I mean, to, in my world, as soon as you sort of dig in and really try and understand the material, then it becomes an advanced material. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, I, I have a last question on, and you talked about mapping uh, R&D centers in, in Europe, uh, but uh, do you also know if uh, they are mapping potential mining areas uh, where where do we have uh, availability of uh, some of these materials uh, that that could make europe uh, stay alone 
I mean, that sounds like a, a potential new research project you are defining there <laughs> to to map the underground of Europe to see where can we find the different things. Uh, mm. I, I'm not aware of uh, this kind of mapping uh, taking place yet, but I, I think it's um, understand also that, that some of these activities are in the early level. So now it's a political decision. We need to do something. So now is the time to bring to the table all these uh, nice ideas like this one, for example, mm. yeah. and then uh, Let's see. Maybe maybe there'll be funding for that. Otherwise, you can you can get a Confos Foundation to to pay for. It. <laughs> yeah, I I'm not sure. I, I think it's on a, a bit higher level. It, it needs to be done. Uh, Nikolai, do you have some uh, final words on, on on the initiative? Do you have some? Uh, some places where people can can go to learn more about it. Uh... Um, I mean, it's uh, there's a message just saying stay tuned, things will happen, and then the advice about you know engage with the academics and and different groups uh, because they're normally fairly well oriented. Or you know, you're welcome to call me if you want to know something. I I do want to advertise one thing if if it's okay. I share my screen. Yeah, please. Um, I, I I got a message just today, so this is in Danish. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, but but we actually tried to uh, uh, within the framework of of a made uh, made materials project to will have a a conference uh, in Aarhus on the 29th of of April, where we're mm -hmm. gonna dig into these things. We'll get some examples from from companies who uh, who made small um, uh, pilot projects and and uh, from industrial PhDs from uh, from syntax actually and also from uh, Advent Technologies and and have academics people. So we're actually looking forward to trying and making it more concrete. And actually, this kind of event is a good place to meet people who also want to engage here and then uh, do something together. And and actually, we have. Uh, People, a couple of people from the ministry coming and telling us what's going on there, and this is a good chance mm. to meet them and give some feedback, saying we need to map the European underground to see where we can find our materials. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Do do we have anything in our underground in Denmark? <laughs> uh, I know could... that that uh, in my garden I have a lot of clay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that's it. Mm. Maybe it is. <laughs> uh, but uh, thank you, Nikolai. Uh, it's very interesting to to learn more about the initiative. Uh, we're not fully there. Uh, I, I I need to dig deeper into it when uh, when when it becomes more specific. But uh, thank you very much for sharing. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah. See you. Bye. Bye.